with a mission, bringing cash from Libya for Arthur Scargill. The Libyans gave over five million, but it's not at all clear that any of it ever reached the striking miners' families. strike in 1984, number 2B Hughes Lane, Wursborough Dale, was Arthur Scargill's modest home. Since then, he's moved to a far bigger house worth well in excess of £200,000. When he lived here, he had a £25,000 mortgage, and one of the allegations we want to put to him tonight is that in December 1984, at the height of the strike, in the middle of a cold, hard winter for the miners, he used Libyan money destined for hardship relief to pay off that mortgage. Six years later, the images of the strike still instantly recall what a fight it was between the miners' leader and Margaret Thatcher. Ashley. But tonight's special cook report is not about the politics, it's about money. After all, the NUM's funds were sequestrated. Officially, it had no money. The recurring question was, how would the union cope? The money rolled in, in its thousands and millions from the old lady off the street, from all over the world, uh, money come from. Always going to Arthur, to his office. For 10 years, until he left, Jim Parker was Mr. Scargill's chauffeur and minder. Who was the only person who knew how much had come in? Was the, it only one person? Only one person knew, and that's Arthur Scargill himself. Jim Parker is one of two men who know what really went on inside NUM headquarters. The second and more important figure is Roger Windsor, chief executive at the time. In 1984, I often believe that George Orwell's book was actually being lived for real in front of us. Scargill had the ability to rewrite history as it occurred. There was a shorthand reporter in every meeting of the National Executive Committee and Finance Committee. After the meeting, she would type up accurately those discussions and those proceedings. And then they were sent upstairs to Mr. Scargill, for his eyes only, to be edited. Any accusations against him would be deleted, and any discussions which took place uh, would accord with the way he felt they should have been carried out rather than actually what took place. We have the proof. The original shorthand, the typed up transcript, Arthur Scargill's new dictation and the new and different version of history. Former Secretary Jane Collier took the notes. The final typed report was not a true account of that NEC meeting. Things were often not as they seemed, says Jim Parker, as ever at the boss's right hand. At Orgreave, Arthur Scargill says he was hit by the police. Mr Parker says he definitely wasn't. The cracker back head with a shield. All I know is that these bastards rushed in and this guy hit the back head with a bloody shield and knocked it ground out. If the truth were known, that policeman didn't knock him down. He actually slipped down the bank. But the look of Scargill made it as it were just nice for him. But that were all calculated. The most startling revelations concern not the routine manipulation of facts, but the manipulation of money. This is Altaf Abassi, a Kashmiri who represents Libyan interests in Britain. He'd met Arthur and offered Libyan money to help hard-pressed miners, and Mr Scargill accepted. Altaf Abassi made three trips, carrying about £50,000 each time, money he delivered to Roger Windsor. Right, sir, that seems to be in order. Thank you very much. I telephoned uh, Roger Windsor, and I asked him when and where he would collect uh, money. He suggested Sheffield. 
near his house. We met at the house that we met in on the first occasion of one of his friends uh, in Sheffield. And he gave me a sum of money around £50,000 and said this was the first of three uh, instalments, a total of around £150,000 that he received from Libya. It was a down payment, an act of good faith. At his new home in France, Roger Windsor recalls what happened when Mr Scargill wanted the money in the office. Also present, Peter Heathfield, NUM General Secretary. I brought the money out of the biscuit tins where they'd been stored away in my house, put them all into a suitcase and brought it into Scargill's office. Scargill opened the suitcase and proceeded to count out into four piles £10,000 for the Knots NUM miners, £29,000 for my own bridging loan, £17,500 uh, for Peter Heathfield's extension and £25,000 uh, for Mr Scargill's own house in Yorkshire or his mortgage with the Yorkshire Union. The remainder of the money in the suitcase he put into his briefcase and at that point he got onto the internal phone and asked Stephen Hudson, the accountant, to come down. Stephen, unprepared for what was going to happen, uh, was asked to take away uh, the bundles of money and give a receipt for each of them uh, to the persons concerned. So this is the scene that Roger Windsor describes. It's December 1984, halfway through the strike, and the three men who run the NUM are counting out the cash to pay off their personal loans when many striking miners were losing their homes. Last week, however, after we'd formally asked for interviews, Mr Heathfield told the National Executive that they'd not paid off their NUM debts in cash, but had instead made use of a hitherto unheard of miners' trust fund. He and Mr Scargill then repaid the same trust fund in cash. Not this cash, but cash they claimed they'd taken from their own bank accounts. Roger Windsor's account is supported by the then NUM accountant, Stephen Hudson, who was called into the room, given a pile of money by each of them, and gave them NUM receipts in return. This is Roger Windsor's receipt, one of the documents Mr Scargill accused him of stealing when he left. When Jim Parker heard about the loan repayments, it was, for him, the last straw. I found out later that the money what were fetched from the Libyans, probably because it wasn't traceable again, were actually used to clear his mortgage, that's Arthur's mortgage, Peter Leefield's and Roger Windsor's. So here I am, thinking I'm, I'm endangering my life and risking my life a little bit, for miners, for, which I didn't mind, that's so his life. But to think I were doing that, to pay their mortgage off, to protect their houses, when miners is losing theirs and, and nothing to eat, whatever, I mean, that's absolutely disgusting, that, to me. That's something that I shall never forgive him for. Roger Windsor has admitted to us and to the Daily Mirror that what they all did was wrong. They took much-needed hardship money when union members faced ruin. Mr Heathfield, Mr Scargill and himself, he says, have lost virtually nothing. So all three of you knowingly misappropriated money intended for an entirely different purpose? Yes. Well, how do you feel about that? Guilty. I mean, at the time, I felt relieved because the bridging loan, which I owed to the NUM, had been discharged and paid, Scargill said, regarded as a, a, as a gift from Libya. But that money was not intended to pay off my mortgage, was not intended to pay off my bridging loan. It was intended to give either to support the union or to support the striking miners. Roger Windsor's belief that both he and Arthur Scargill were morally and legally wrong to divert Libyan hardship money for personal use is confirmed by the court-appointed NUM receiver, Michael Arnold. Although I'm not a lawyer, I would suggest that that is clearly a breach of trust, uh, at best. Uh, at worst, possibly, a criminal act. And if money came in for hardship purposes from a foreign country and was used to pay off mortgages belonging to senior NUM officials, that would fit into that category. Depending entirely what that foreign country thought it was uh, providing the money for. 
well, if they were adamant, as they are, that uh, it was for hardship purposes? I would say that at best it would be a breach of trust. In the Welsh valleys, as elsewhere, many a miner's family desperately needed help from the Miners' Solidarity Trust. This trust was specifically set up to allow money to be given for hardship relief without being regarded by the sequestrators as an NUM asset. An NUM research officer, now an MP, recalls there was a mystery over a large amount of money sent from Russia. A delegation of Russian miners, I think, in uh, 1986, maybe late 1985, um, certainly told the, uh, the South Wales area that a large amount of money had left Moscow, um, which was designated for the British miners. Um, and they were a bit puzzled when I and others said, well, what happened to it? How much was it? Where did it go? Because we could never trace that money. I think that that will add massively to the sense of disillusionment about the way in which the strike was run. They would certainly have eased the situation that so many people found themselves in, and that, after all, was really the, the most important thing. The only visible proof of Russian help were two shiploads of food and clothing which arrived at Immingham and Barry, but were turned away because they didn't have the right paperwork. Arthur Scargill denied any money was received. But that, says Roger Windsor, is not true. In 1984, as the receiver was coming into office, Stephen Hudson came down to me one day, very uh, anxious to have a word with me, because he said, uh, I think a million dollars had been received in the NUM's bank account in Geneva, the official NUM bank account. The $1 million was indeed sent from Russia to the Union's Swiss bank account. The NUM's accountant at the time confirms the transaction. Remember, it could have been sent to the Miners' Solidarity Trust. Instead, Arthur Scargill chose to send it back to the Eastern Bloc, officially to keep it out of the hands of the sequestrators. One year later, the money turned up at the Narodowy Polski Bank in Warsaw. Mr Heathfield came to me uh, about a year after the strike, had finished and said, Roger, our problems are over. The money's been received in the Polish bank account. And the Polish bank account was the one that Mr. Scargill had given me details of for the Libyans to send money to. An account apparently set up uh, under the name of a Miners' Action Committee over which Mr. Heathfield and Mr. Scargill were the sole signatories. It was not audited uh, by the NUM's auditors. Uh, it was not money reflected in the NUM's accounts certainly didn't go into the Miners' Solidarity Fund. And the only people who knew about the bank account, apart from me, who was told about it, the only ones who had any uh, authority over their bank account were Mr Scargill and Mr Heathfield. Today, Arthur Scargill still denies Russian money was received, though Peter Heathfield wrote thanking the then Russian president for financial aid. And the Russian miners' leader, Mikhail Shrebny, has confirmed to us that a million was sent. But the biggest foreign donation is also the most controversial. So controversial, in fact, that for five years, Arthur Scargill has consistently denied it was ever given or even offered. The amount, between five and seven million, the donor, Libya. Policewoman Yvonne Fletcher was barely six months dead, yet Arthur Scargill, whatever he says, was seeking money from her murderers. We have no links with Libya, we haven't, formal or informal. Secondly, we have said absolutely clearly that we don't and will not accept any aid from the Libyan government. And thirdly, all that we did was to simply send one of our representatives over to simply explain the position of the union's case at the moment. So Arthur Scargill lied three times. He had links with Libya. He did send Windsor to ask for money. He did take the money. And this is how it started. Mr. Scargill gave me this letter. It was the only one that he ever gave me during the strike, and presumably there were many offers of help during the strike uh, of this nature, and asked me to contact uh, a Mr. Abbasi, who lived in Doncaster, which I did. A meeting was arranged between Al Taf Abbasi and Arthur Scargill at the TUC conference in the Winter Gardens at Blackpool. Mr. Scargill's concern? Money. He worked out a figure, the amount of money that was being spent on the, the, the community kitchens and whatever their hardship cases were, amounted to a figure of three million US dollars. 
that was specifically for hardship relief and nothing <clears throat> it else? It was specifically for hardship and nothing else. The next meeting took place in Arthur Scargill's car. Jim Parker, as ever, was there. Arthur told me that we were actually meeting Libyans and we were going to meet him on the front at St Andrews. And uh, it was a bit uh, spooky sort of thing. Uh, we didn't know really what was going to happen and what have you. And when we got there, he told me to sort of go around the area and make sure that there were no vehicles parked, meaning so the MI5 or anybody else. The meeting then took place in the back of the car. We had them in the front, them two in the back, and I'm sort of him saying that, you know, we're in trouble with the strike, you know, there's a big strike going on and we want any money. Um, the memory serves me right again. He was asking for sort of two million quid uh, in support of the strike. There was yet another meeting. Arthur Scargill went to Paris to the CGT, the communist-dominated equivalent of the TUC. This time he met a much more senior Libyan representative. Mr Scargill explained to Ibrahim Salim, uh, the envoy of the Libyan government, the problems that the NU was, NUM was facing, sequestration, we didn't know about receivership at that stage. Uh, the plight of the striking miners, uh, the poverty, the hardship, uh, the fact he relayed, related to, to Mr. Uh, Salim that uh, miners were unable to bury their dead, which to an Arab person it, it is about the worst thing that can happen uh, in life. The kiss that shook Britain, a senior NUM man embracing Colonel Gaddafi on TV. Safely at home, Arthur Scargill, having dispatched his chief executive, kept denying that he was seeking money. In Gaddafi's tent, Mr. Windsor, on instructions, left details of the NUM's Polish bank account. When the money didn't turn up, Mr. Scargill got very agitated. Although he said to the press that we had not asked for financial assistance from Libya, he kept pressing me as to when money was going to come. I contacted Mr. Abazi again, and at Mr. Scargill's request, we had a meeting in my home. Uh, Mr. Scargill wouldn't meet uh, uh, Abasi in his own home. He wouldn't meet him uh, in the NUM offices, but he felt that my home and my family home was a, an appropriate place for the meeting to take place. Mr. Abasi came in the front door, and Mr. and Mrs. Scargill came in the back door, and they met in our dining room. And Mr. Scargill explained to Mr. Abasi that it was important that the money would be forthcoming. Mr. Abbasi said, well, it was still important for Mr. Scargill to go over to Tripoli and meet President Gaddafi. This would help to release the millions of pounds that had been promised. Uh, but nevertheless, he would contact Libya and see what could be done. Then, to our astonishment, Mr. Scargill uh, asked Mr. Abbasi if he could provide him uh, with some weapons. Uh, this came out of the blue to me. Mm, weapons had not been talked about before, but he wanted personal firearms a revolver for himself, a little lady's revolver that he could keep in the car, and a pump-action shotgun. Not the first time that Mr. Scargill had asked to be supplied with weapons, says Jim Parker. He had a, a bee in his bonnet about sort of gain a little derringer. He wanted us both to have one. And I said, well, I don't think you can do that. You know, it ain't quite legal sort of thing. To that extent, he frightened me in the sense that I thought it, with his connections he would generate one. Mr. Scargill apparently asked other people for guns too, but in Altaf Abbasi's case, settled for the money instead. So how much money did the Libyans make available to the NUN? Uh, Nine million dollars. And was there any concern about how that money had been handled? Well, uh, once money was uh, made available to them, what, what I understand that money was transferred to Europe, and it was made available for trade union movement or NUM to use uh, as and when they find it necessary. But for hardship purposes only? Only for hardship purposes, yes, and nothing else. Many miners needed all the help they could get. The soup kitchens were rarely empty. The Libyan money, like any other clearly designated hardship donation, could have been sent through the Miners' Solidarity Trust, direct from source. Trustee Richard Caborn, MP. As long as the monies were made clearly to the hardship fund, uh, then that money would have gone into the hardship fund. If you wanted clearing, then it would be held in the holding account until it was cleared, till the bank manager was satisfied 
that it was destined for the hardship fund and then it would be cleared. So if you'd got a cheque, for example, for five million pounds from Libya made out to the hardship fund, bearing in mind the hardship, you'd have taken it? We would have taken it. Fortunately, a good deal of help did get through. Donations from Europe, for example, were generous. What the striking British miners didn't know, however, was that here in France, Arthur Scargill had broadened his ambitions with the help of the communist-dominated CGT, the French TUC. He created and became the president of the IMO, the International Miners' Organization. Bank accounts were apparently set up in the name of the I IMO before the IMO was even launched. Uh, so there's Mr. Scargill's IMO, which he runs uh, as a kind of international banking organization. And there's the real I IMO, which is representing the interests of miners uh, on a worldwide basis. In a Paris suburb, the only identification of the IMO's offices is a handwritten notice that Arthur Scargill is its president and CGT militant Alain Simon, its general secretary, is public knowledge. Alain. Hidden away from the public gaze, however, are some very interesting bank accounts and some rather strange transactions. A large loan from the NUR to the NUM was repaid with this IMO cheque from an Irish bank signed by Arthur Scargill. At another Irish bank, a friend of Arthur Scargill's once banked at least a quarter of a million pounds. In the event of her death, any balance was to be put into the hands of Arthur Scargill and Peter Heathfield. A Danish bank opened three accounts in the name A. Pickering, the maiden name of Arthur Scargill's deceased mother. And to Roger Windsor's surprise and puzzlement, the £29,500 he admits he owes to someone, Arthur Scargill now says is owed to the IMO. I don't believe it should be paid back to the IMO. Can you tell me, you know, how is it that the IMO have uh, taken over this debt, as he put it to me, um, when the Libyans gave it? And I think I've said to him, I either pay it back to Libya or I pay it back to the Minor Solidarity Fund to which it should have gone in the first place. I feel guilty about it. Uh, and I'd like to get the matter put straight again. Five years ago, almost to the day, the miners returned to work disillusioned and defeated. But evidence is still emerging of Machiavellian machinations, which are a world away from working class solidarity. President Scargill's splendid new home in Wurzborough Bridge is guarded by 10 TV security cameras. Of the Russian money, there is no trace. Altaf Abassi says that after an official inquiry over the last three months, most of the Libyan money has been returned. There's no proposition that any of that has been used for Mr. Scargill's personal financial gain. His political ambition is a different story. But there remains the question of that £25,000 mortgage. Bundles of cash counted out of a suitcase which Roger Windsor brought in from his larder where he'd been keeping the money since it was delivered by Mr. Abassi from Libya. I think that you must be misunderstanding what I'm saying. What I've said about three times now to you is if you've got any questions at all about any matters, all you have to do is to put them in writing, send them to me, and I'll make inquiries. And I'm saying you shouldn't need to make inquiries about what you personally did. There's no documentation to look for. All you have to do is tell me whether or not you counted out bundles of cash for you, for Peter Heathfield, and for Roger Windsor on your office desk. Mr. Cook. Did you or did you not? Mr. Cook, if you've got any questions at all about any matters to which you've referred in correspondence, all I'm suggesting is that you put those questions in writing, send them to me, and I'll make inquiries. 